In 2016, I co-founded a drinkware company called Simple Modern. I was obsessed with the question, what would happen if we built a for-profit company focused on generosity? This podcast is a behind-the-scenes look at how we scaled from a bootstrapped startup to nine figures in annual revenue. We'll share with you the strategies we used, things learned along the way, and how we built a different type of company. This is Scaling for Good. Welcome back to Scaling for Good. I'm Mike Beckham, your host. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Simple Modern. And today I'm joined by a guest who has the distinction of being probably the most naturally entrepreneurial person that I have ever met. I met him during his first week as a college student. I remember, I met a lot of students over the years, but I remember thinking that is a very unique individual with a lot of giftings. And I could see his flair for entrepreneurship even at that early age. Uh, We've been friends for almost 20 years at this point. uh, And now he serves as the chief sales officer for Simple Modern. And it's my pleasure to have Carson Rock on Scaling for Good today with me. Welcome to the show, Carson. Thanks for having me. I am super excited to get to sit down and chat with you today. Absolutely. Well, let's start with something easy. Fill us in on your background pre-Simple Modern. What led you to Simple Modern? Yeah, before Simple Modern... um, As you said, I I knew I always wanted to be entrepreneurial, and I knew that starting businesses was going to be a part of what I wanted to do from an early age. I was always interested in business, and my brother and I had a lawn mowing business growing up in high school and college, and um, that was super fun. But getting into college, I knew I wanted to try to be a part of starting something um, that could be bigger than just mowing lawns and impact more people, be able to employ more people, and um, just growing a business um, that like that. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be a part of growing a business. And so came right out of college and with a really good friend started uh, a furniture business, which was, seemed like an amazing opportunity at the time. And uh, we had a lot of fun. We learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot about what we didn't know. We learned a lot uh, about being undercapitalized uh, as we tried to bootstrap that business. And it was a really great experience, but ultimately wasn't something that was panning out the way that we had hoped and drawn it up from when we sat down. And that was, uh, in a lot of ways when you and I sat down and reconnected and you, uh, in your entrepreneurial journey was about to start and launch, uh, another website. And we sat down, I remember vividly having lunch with you one day and you said, Hey, why don't you just come work uh, with us for a year or two and see what it's like to be a part of the e-commerce world and to, to learn about selling things online. And I was acutely aware of the shortcomings in my own skill set about selling things online uh, based on the experience I was having in the furniture business. And so it sounded like an incredible opportunity. So we, I went and worked with you at that family of companies for a year and a half and got to spend a lot of time with you and Brian and Micah mm-hmm. and uh, really all, you know, the rest of that founding team at, at Simple Modern and saying, hey, this is um, a really cool group of people that has a really unique skill set, especially for where we were in Oklahoma. When you you made the decision to join the company, um, and and actually, like I think this is worth telling if you're comfortable sharing it. What was the agreement we made with you joining the company when it came to ownership and stuff like that? Yeah, um, my wife and I, you know, we we prayed about it a lot, and we had really felt called to um, the business that we had started together, and um, just. I, I always knew I wanted to be entrepreneurial. So when we both had two full-time jobs, um, we just lived off of one salary and saved the rest, like try to make sure we live well within our means um, to be able to save up for when the next opportunity or, or venture came along. Um, but we had poured all of our life savings into this other business. Um, and we had, and that business wasn't making money yet. And yeah. so um, we were really thinking about, you know, what the Simple Modern Opportunity could be. And, uh, you know, you, you talked about, you appreciate things more when you have other entrepreneurial experience. And when I had that first box of samples of water bottles and I kind of went around door to door to small shops around Oklahoma and said, Hey, would you want to buy this? There was a level of just immediate product market fit that Mm -hmm. I had never experienced Mm -hmm. in my entrepreneurial journey. It, It was so clear people want this product like there is a need in the market for what we had made what we were trying to sell and from that moment on uh 
sat down with my wife and said, we got to figure out a way to be a part of this company because this is going to be something like this is, this is a product that really fills a need. And, and it was something that I'd never experienced, um, in selling before I had had lots of experience trying to sell things that didn't have that kind of immediate, someone just looks at it and says, yeah, I want to buy it. Um, yeah. And so I think that was what I knew was going to make Simple Modern special. And so as Katie and I were thinking about how do we be a part of this, I was like, well, we don't have a ton of money to, uh, you know, buy in a big chunk of this company. And so, um, you know, we sat down and said, hey, can we give you, a, you know, we'll, we'll go borrow some money. And my wife quit her steady job to run the business that we had started together full time. And we said, at this time, we didn't have any kids. Like, let's just go all in on entrepreneurship. Let's just say, yeah. hey, let's find a way to make it happen. So Katie ran our business uh, day to day. And then I jumped in to do Simple Modern. Um, and originally, I was like, hey, I'll keep helping you with what we're doing. Uh, and then, you know, I'll just do Simple Modern during business hours. And um, then I think what just became evident really quickly was the way that Simple Modern was growing. So we we had borrowed this money, leveraged it against our house and said, hey, we're going to buy part of Simple Modern. I'm going to work for free for no salary um, for six months. Or yeah. Something. I, yes. I think it was six or nine months or something um, to say, hey, like I know that Simple Modern didn't have any cash coming in. There wasn't, um, you know, you guys were in a position to where you're still employed Um and so sitting there every day during business hours trying to figure it out with no money coming in, that puts you in a really unique spot. Um, but I knew from just the initial interactions I had with potential customers, this was a brand that was going to be something. Yeah. So we, we brought you on in a role to try and help sell some things into physical retail when we were basically doing all of our sales online. We just sold a big program to Sam's Club None of us really knew anything about what it meant to manage that. We we kind of caught a fish way bigger than the boat we were For in, sure. so to speak. And so we we went and hired uh, in a vice president of sales role someone who had a lot of CPG experience. And it set up this period where I, your title, I think, might have been chief sales officer the entire time. Um, but really, we asked you to do a lot of different things. And maybe this is, you know, part of uh, what's interesting about it is how uh, titles don't matter very much no. early on in a company. It's really about what needs to get done and who's best suited to do it. What are some of the different things that uh, you did during that period, different ways that you uh, applied leadership and helped stand things up? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, like you said, in the early days, everything's changing so fast. And um, what the organization needs this week may be different than what the organization needs next week. And I think that when you're someone who's just has this vested interest in saying, hey, we got to make this happen and it's not going to happen unless somebody does it. Like mm -hmm. we don't have a professional to make sure everyone gets paid on Friday. We don't have a professional to make sure that, uh, you know, the photos got taken or the uh, whatever needed to happen for the website that week happens. Like we it was just a really small team. And so I think that what I found myself bouncing around doing once we kind of had that um, core professional, and what I like to say uh, to team members that came on for a really long time is like, when the company started, I just did whatever needed to happen until we had the money to hire someone that was actually a professional at <laughs> right. doing uh, that focus job. On that. You were like focus the ultimate generalist. Yeah, yeah, period. it really was. So I, I, I found myself taking the pictures um, f of our products. Um, we would mail some off to some agencies. Do we some, still use any of those pictures? I person? hope we don't use any of those <laughs> pictures. Those are, uh, I think that maybe one of them still lives on our Instagram account uh, okay. towards the very beginning. And you can probably tell which one it is. Your, your magnum opus. That's right. That is, that's the peak of all my photography skills. But um, I took a like weekend 24 hour Photoshop course to be able to do graphic designs because there were so many things that we needed to edit and change uh, just to make it look a little better. And while um, I'm not very good at it still, um, it was just like, hey, I got to figure out how to do this. And I don't know anything right now. So I've, I've got to go learn that. Um, we were, there was customer support questions that needed to be answered. Um, and like I said, my wife, Katie, jumped in to help with some of those things. There were people that wanted to buy stuff that we hadn't decided, are we going to sell to that type of channel, are we going to sell to this type of place? We have to make those decisions. Um, a lot of administrative things that needed to happen, like 
your business needs to have insurance. You got this great program with Sam's Club. So that means you need all this type of insurance. And it was like, wow, that is expensive. I didn't know that it cost this much to actually uh, <laughs> right. like meet all the requirements that someone needs just to be able to sell them something. Um, and I think that uh, I found myself with no shortage of things to do, uh, even though there were like such a widespread net of different responsibilities that needed to, to get picked up. And I think that I felt like it was a really helpful thing to be able to have uh, just a real generous like me on staff um, while you were, could be focused on leading the company. Because I think you're also an incredibly talented journalist as well. You're you're a person that will figure out how to do whatever needs to get done, uh, whether you have a lot of experience with it or not. And I, But I think that um, some of those things I was able to just kind of walk around and pick up so that they didn't have to be worried about um, so that you could keep focusing on kind of leading and driving us forward in really big chunks. So you did you did all of these you know generalist things uh, for a number of years. You helped stand up our, our custom business unit, which we'll talk more about because that's something that you provide leadership to today. Um, and then eventually I, I came to you and said, hey, uh, I want to move Chris from this vice president of sales role and I want you to really lead in the sales effort across physical retail. Um, at that point, you still weren't very old. I mean, you're, you're one of the younger uh, guys at the company. You're st- you were maybe 27, 28, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, I think so, right around there. And so, and as you and I talked about it, one of the things that you said to me that I thought uh, was really helpful is you said, I, I would love it if the company will grow with me because you, you knew that there was a lot that you didn't know, but you wanted to grow into that. You really felt like you could be excellent at the role. And you know, standing here several years later, looking back, you've developed into an outstanding chief sales officer. But I do think that part of it was you being, you saying to me, if the company will you know, give me some rope to swing with and will grow with me, I can grow into this role, even though I don't have the experience. So that was a pretty key moment when instead of going and finding somebody else that had a background in this, that we said, all right, Carson, you're going to run this. And really you've built our physical retail sales organization since that point. And that's what I want to spend the majority of our time talking about today is how do you build a sales organization? So uh, let's let's start really high level. What are all of the different um, sales functions that you're in charge of at the organization? I'm in charge of pretty much anything that doesn't happen on amazon.com or any of its subsidiaries or simplemodern.com uh, and our D2C website. So I try to help with all of our physical retail relationships or customized sales or uh, you know new possible kind of retail type of sales outlets for Simple Modern. That's, yeah. that's what I'm focused on right now. Who are some of the biggest uh, names that we work with? We get to spend a lot of time uh, in my departments with the teams at Target and Walmart and Sam's Club. Um, They are tremendous partners that have been with us now for several years. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been tasked with growing our physical retail presence. And then I think you mentioned this, or I mentioned this, but we also have a custom business, which is where uh, companies from, you know, the local coffee shop all the way up to Google and Microsoft can come to us and say, hey, we would love, we'd love bottles with laser engraving or with color printing. And you also run those sales as well. The the custom business has got a really special place, I think, in the growth of where Simple Modern has been because we always knew that there was something unique about selling a really high quality product that can be co-branded with someone else's logo. And I think that the way that we have seen custom grown has been uh, tremendous just from like the the organic demand that has come from people saying, hey, I got one of your products at Target. I got one of your products at Walmart or on Amazon. And I would love to get my business's logo on it too. Um, And I think that that has been a really cool thing to see. It's very special to know, especially from where I've come from and just like the small business entrepreneurship uh, type of mindset that uh, will always be inside of me to know that someone who has limited capital and limited resources wants to make the investment of their brand name on Simple Modern Product. Yeah, I think you're that literally special. working with people that are the definition of a mom and pop or a, you know a small business all the way up to literally the biggest businesses the world has ever seen. Yes. And so let's start by talking about some of these really big partners. 
Uh, when you're working with the biggest retailers in the world, uh, obviously we're trying to uh, portray a point of view about our brand and about how we can help serve their customers. And we're trying to really build brand equity in the eyes of those retailers. How do you go about that? How do you go about um, building brand equity with the Targets and Walmarts of the world? Where most of it starts in terms of building brand equity with some of the the greatest retailers in the world uh, is remembering that these are really talented people and Mm -hmm. they are very sharp. And when you're working with someone like that, just being able to tell a good story doesn't go far enough. You yeah. have to bring data. You have to have... They are analytical. They are analytical people. Yeah, yeah th- these are people that really deeply dive into numbers that understand uh, the reasons behind uh, why changes are happening in a market, why people are having success. And I think that the biggest way that you have to establish credibility as a brand is to be able to sit down and share numbers and say, this is what is happening. This is the experience that our brand is having. And very early on in the growth of the company, we were having this incredible run of success on Amazon.com. And that was at a really crucial time when we were starting to have some meetings with um, really, really quality retail partners that wanted to be a part of the ways that we were bringing growth to the category on Amazon. There, there was some real, you know, I think Amazon's always been a pretty scary competitor. Sure. But I think especially as you got into 2017, 2018, there was just some real palpable like, wow, Amazon is taking over and they are just gobbling up share in some places and the future is going to be highly digital. Like how do how do our businesses grow and compete with Amazon uh, over the next 10 years, 20 years? This is a, a big question that was on the mind of every buyer. So what was the story that, that you would tell them when that's the question they're asking? The story that we would really talk about uh, primarily was that we were not an incumbent brand, mm-hmm. that we were not someone that did things the way that things may or may not have supposed to have been done in retail, and that there were actually a tremendous amount of advantages to thinking that way. I think that... Can you can you give an example of that? Like, what would be an advantage? Because we didn't. We didn't even know the right way to do no, things. No, we didn't. You know, so like, and we definitely didn't build the company the way that they used to build companies. Why was that an advantage in your mind? I think for the unique time that we entered into this space, there was a lot of change in the way that customers thought about our category. Mm-hmm. And those did not play very well with some of the traditional best outcomes for companies that made and sold products in physical retail environments. They would be very focused on making sure that um, certain sets of functionality or features um, could live for a very long time on the shelf because it costs a lot of money to send something out to a store and then take it all back out or mark it down and clear it out so we can bring in something new. And here we were sitting on Amazon reinventing the color selection that we had every three or four months where, yeah. you know, we've got new colors coming out and ended up, uh, the cycle got faster and faster to where at one point we were testing new colors weekly yeah. uh, at some incredible rate, which was a rate that no one else even thought about it like that to sit down and say, how, how fast can we actually change? How fast can we get better? And I think that that type of mindset, which really I think in a lot of ways came from being digitally native, I think your experience um, with your portfolio of e-commerce companies before this really impacted the way that all of us thought about how you can grow a brand, what it means to be digitally native. And some of the key building blocks of a digital brand are very different and actually kind of counterintuitive to the way that a lot of traditional large scale uh, or conglomerate owned uh, consumer brands think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I I think that the world obviously is speeding up and agility was starting to really matter. We've talked about this in other episodes, but we identified that we thought fashion and style was going to be a big part of this category. And for sure, if that's the case, there's going to be a lot of turnover and there's going to need to be, you're going to need to have agility because trends come and go and they change. 
One of the things that we took advantage of, as you mentioned, being built around digital distribution, is that once somebody comes to your listing for a water bottle, for example, you can show them 45 colors. There's there's kind of an infinite shelf once they, they come to your listing, whereas if so let's say Walmart or Target gives you space on the shelf. They can't give you 45 spots. You know, you might get one or two spots. And so you, you're not able to offer the same kind of selection, but also the the lead times and the timetables are very different, right? So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. If I see something uh, on a shelf, like what was the process? Walk me through the process of something, how something got there. If you see something on a shelf that's like, hey, new item, this is something fresh on a retailer store, the vendors probably started talking to the buying teams at, at that specific retailer between nine and 12 months ago. So they started to identify, hey, here's an opportunity. Here's where we want to see change. Here's how uh, we are updating the things that we want to sell to you. Let's sit down and have a conversation about it. And so really about nine months before, uh, bet- between nine and 12 months before something gets to a shelf, you're starting to have initial meetings to say, hey, here's what we think next year should look like. And uh, a lot of the biggest retailers work in kind of these different cadences where between one or two times a year, they'll choose to make significant changes to the assortment that they show to customers on an everyday basis. When you walk down one of those aisles that's dedicated to a department um, that you're going to find this item sitting there every single day. And so they go through these processes to say, how do we make sure that we're um, keeping the best things from the best brands uh, out there for our customers? And so you start about nine months in advance and then have the conversations about what sizes should look like, what colors should look like, what prices can look like, what quantities can look like, how we think items are going to perform and really work very collaboratively. And I think that the best partnerships that we've been able to develop have been the ones that are extremely collaborative in nature. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very easy especially when you sell things to a retailer who sells things to the end consumer to just be very transactional uh, in the way that you operate. Like, hey, this is the best thing I have to sell. This is the price. You should buy it. This is the price. Take it or leave it. And that's just not the way that I think the people here are wired to work. Um, And I think the way that we want to have interactions is saying, hey, how can we be helpful? How can we find ways to help grow what's happening Yeah. Know your business, know your customer and help you to solve the problems you're trying to solve instead of just saying, hey, we've got a bunch of this in our warehouse and if you want some, you can have it and here's the price. Yeah. Or the only reason that they would switch to us is just because we're willing to do it a little cheaper than someone else. I think that that is uh, traditionally a great framework. And I think that competitive marketplaces do amazing things to drive value for the end customer. Um, But what we wanted to do is to come in and say, how can we be a complementary or incremental part of the things that you sell on your shelf today? Because we have incredible competitors in this space. I think that um, I just look across the different shelves in retail and I think, wow, we get to compete against some people that really make amazing products. There's a lot of well-run companies. And to me, I enjoy that. I think that if we were in an industry where we had competitors that weren't well run, I think uh, that I would get bored. And I I think that I would not be able to grow as much as a leader. So I actually like it when we have competitors and you see them release something and think, man, I wish we'd done that. Or that was really smart. Mm -hmm. Or wow, like they're really challenging us. Um, I love that. So you are making suggestions to the retailer. I think this is a good uh, time to point out a a decision. You know, you make all these decisions along the way, but that end up impacting the way that you run the business. And one of the decisions that we had to make was, uh, this is very tactical, but I think it, it reflects what you're talking about. Are we going to have different items for in terms of like the actual SKU, are we going to have different items for Target versus Amazon? Or are we going to try and sell the same items everywhere? And we said, we want to partner with each sales channel and we are going to do unique items for every sales channel. Uh, and I think it really was born out of what you're talking about, that instead of saying, hey, we're going to make a bunch of this one item and then we're going to ship it out to 50 different places we said, no, we're actually going to try and build items that are unique around every single person we sell with so that we can partner with them and help them meet their needs. There is a lot of complexity and brain damage and and sometimes inventory problems that can come with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's been a lot of upside as well, right? 
there's definitely been a lot of upside. And I think it, it goes back in many ways to what we were talking about um, just a few minutes ago that sometimes not knowing how things are supposed to work or how you're supposed to do things right. um, actually becomes advantage. Because what we sat down and as we said, how do we set this partnership up um, to where we can really serve our customer, whether that, you know, the retailer, whoever we're working with, how can we serve them the best? And the way that we came up with was saying, well, it doesn't mean that they're competing with our largest channel, Amazon, mm -hmm. to see if we can fill their order this week. It means that we buy things that we're planning just to sell for them. This is worth emphasizing. When you're growing, you have to use inventory to, to fuel those sales. And so there were a lot of years where it was like, well, we grew 100% on Amazon last year. So we, what do we think we're going to grow next year? I don't know. You know, we're probably going to grow a lot. Is that 60%? Is that 100%? And then, oh, by the way, even if you knew what your growth rate was, you wouldn't know how it was happening on an individual item level. Mm -hmm. So when you actually dig in to the, the details, you realize it's just a disaster. You know, It's like, basically you're wrong on every single item you sell. You either have too little or too much. You know? and, and hopefully uh, in aggregate, you kind of are okay where you, you don't, like for example, if you've got a tumbler that's really hot, you're not wrong where you're out of every single color. You're just, you have some colors that you're heavy on and some colors that you didn't buy enough of. But the reality is you basically never get it absolutely right. And this is what makes running a, a consumer products company so difficult. And also what makes uh, dealing with growth so challenging. Mm -hmm. So if you share products between different uh, customers, then you just exacerbate that problem because uh, your number two customer, or number three customer, you're going to have a lot of conversations where you're going back to them and saying, sorry, I don't have what you need. Somebody else, you know, I'm out of it or somebody else is getting the little bit that I do have. Uh, and that can create all kinds of problems. It definitely can. And I think that one of the things that um, we didn't realize uh, as much as we see today is that the partners that we got to work with at the very beginning and the partners that we, we really got to build the brand around um, had some unique overlap with the way that we thought about delivering value to customers. And not every retailer thinks that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we were very intentional about was choosing who we worked with, and where Simple Modern Product showed up. This did not mean that we said yes to everyone. Yeah. But I think that we maybe even underestimated the importance of the overlap of values of retail partners that were extremely committed to delivering an incredible value to their customers uh, at every turn and at every corner. I, I want to dig in on this because obviously when you're early on, you're trying to get to financial stability. You're trying to get to scale. You're trying to get to people recognizing your brand. And so any sale feels like attractive. Yes. But one of the things that I think has, when, when you first took the role, I gave you a piece of advice about it, which is, what, what was the piece of advice for the, everybody listening? You said, this job is not about the sales that you make. This job is about the times that you choose not to make. That's sale. right. You, you think it's about selling. You think that it's about, you know, getting people to say yes and shaking hands and closing deals and like, okay, obviously that has to happen. But actually success in this role is as much about when you say no and what you walk away from. And so I would love to hear, I think you've done a very good job at this, of being strategic about when you said no, when you walked away from opportunities, when do you walk away from an opportunity? We try to have uh, a rubric and framework that we run every possible, uh, not only partnership, but then specific deal through. So even when we're just evaluating the retail partners that we want to work with, we want to make sure that there is a significant amount of overlap um, and that we as a brand as, and as a team are going to be able to deliver on the things that help make that retailers serve their customers really well. And if we can't do those things, then that's not a relationship that we even want to start with just at, at the partnership level. Okay. So in, in specific terms, without maybe necessarily mentioning the partner, what's an example of an opportunity that you ran it through the rubric and you said, I'm walking away from that? Yeah. Uh, great question. We have had 
several partnerships with uh, partnership potentials with people that have come to us uh, with a special framework and they uh, just in the way that they had been built over this was a multi hundred year old company um, they were pretty inefficient uh, Mm -hmm. in the way that they actually handled their supply chain and the way that they ran their marketing and it created a situation where what they were going to have to end up charging the end customer for our product um, was just not going to end up being competitive with the market because, and it was really due to some of the inefficiencies of their own business. Right. Um, it wasn't, they had plenty of scale. They had plenty of um, customers, plenty of customers. It was really due to some of their own inefficiencies. And we sat down and said, this is a retail brand, a retailer that we would love to be associated with. This is uh something that could pan out into a, a really great financial partnership, but it's not going to deliver on the simple modern experience that we want to be known for to the end customer. And that, so that's not something that, I and that's yes that to. you, you, you get more than you feel like you paid for. That's, that's the experience you're talking about. That's what about. we want. Yeah, yeah. We, we, anytime you find simple modern somewhere, we want to sit at this intersection of style and quality and value that, um, people know, that they got the most they could have for their money. Mm -hmm. Today's episode is brought to you by the Bluebird Group. Years ago, we wanted to break into mass retail and we thought Target would be the ideal place for our products. Our problem? We knew nothing about selling into mass retail. We emailed the buyer with no response. We could not find a way in. That was when we were introduced to experts at the Bluebird Group. The Bluebird Group is an organization of professionals who've spent their career working inside of and selling into the biggest retailers in the world. They help clients successfully sell into Target, Best Buy, Walmart, Amazon, and Costco. Through our relationship with the Bluebird Group, we were able to get in front of decision makers and deliver a compelling vision about how we could partner together with Target. Over the last six years, Bluebird has helped us to grow our business every step of the way helped us with everything from administrative details to developing new partnerships to fine-tuning our omni-channel strategy. We've been able to grow the business to tens of millions in annual sales as a result of their coaching and their partnership. It's easy for me to advocate for Bluebird and everything they've done for us at Simple Bond. You have, over the last four years, been front and center for an absolute supply chain disaster, you know, starting with COVID, um, just to give some kind of backstory for people listening to this, when COVID initially hit the U.S. and there were the, you know, shelter in place orders, uh, we had a growing business with Target. Target came to us within a, a week and said, hey, we cannot even send you purchase orders for the indefinite future because, all of our buying power, all of our, you know, uh, warehouse availability and space is going to go towards essential goods and uh, things like uh, medical supplies and, and things like that. So unfortunately, we can't buy from you and we don't know when we can buy from you. And that kind of kicked off, I would say, really what's been a three or four year period of just volatility and challenges to be worked through. You've been front and center with that. Uh, there have been many things that we planned, and then by the time it's time for them to come to fruition, uh, it's not a good plan anymore because the way that uh, things have changed. So how have you managed and worked through all the adversity that's come with that, and, and how do you deal with it when things don't go as expected? Dealing with things not going as they expected, I think at the end of the day, is a big part of entrepreneurship in general. I think that when you think about business, um, I think about times when we sat down at at the very first days in my living room and you asked the question, like, what what do you want this company to end up being? Um, The way that the company has developed and changed has, there are so many things and so many dreams that have come true out of what Mm -hmm. we've been able to build. And then in so many other ways, the way that we've gotten here has looked totally different than we could have scripted it out. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that one of the things that I've always appreciated uh, about your leadership style is that you are always willing to 
rethink things when new information comes to light. And so I think that at the core of this organization, there is a willingness to look at a problem and say, now that we know these things, how are we going to handle it differently? How are we going to change the way that we think? And it is very easy, um, especially in leadership roles, to say, well, this is how we said we were going to do it, so we got to stick with this plan, right? Um, But I think that kind of the, the entrepreneurial spirit that we have across Simple Modern has made it to where um, the whole team is willing to say, hey, the situation has changed. We got dealt a different hand than we thought we were going to. We have to adapt now. And so very specifically with some of the supply chain dif- difficulties and instability across all of the retail environment, um, that created situations where not only at the sales level, but I think that because we had an organization full of people that were willing to pivot, to willing to learn new things, willing to try different strategies, it made it to where very difficult situations, uh, we at least had options that yeah. some people didn't because our logistics and our manufacturing and our planning and our accounting teams were willing to sit down and say, how can we think about these problems differently? How can we try to solve some of these things um, in ways that we may not have thought before? And I I think that we we could have found ourselves in a situation where it was like, well, we said we were going to do this. We got to try to do this. Or I guess we're sunk because... We can't change. Let's let's be really practical. Uh, I'll I'll share an example, and we can kind of talk about how we handled it. So we had a new partnership with Walmart where we were going into Walmart's nationwide with adult products, and we were going to be trying a couple of new things. We were doing some larger form plastic water bottles that we hadn't done before. And when you go into when you say yes to something like that you're really having to rely heavily on the retailer and their guesses at what's going to happen. So uh, one of the things that's hard is you can't even really evaluate their guesses. You don't have, you don't know enough to even know uh, to have an opinion on their guesses. You really have to take their guidance. Um, And about the same time that we, we said yes to this, the supply chain was uh, it was so broken that it could take, we, it had traditionally taken us, uh, you know, maybe 90 days from when we placed an order to when that product would arrive uh, actually in a warehouse. Um, that number had swelled to over 200 in some cases. And with mass retail partners, one of the most important things that they're looking to us for is that we are going to be in stock. So mm-hmm. it really wasn't acceptable, uh, the idea that we, we wouldn't have product on hand when they needed it. As a result, we had to order, based on projections, almost an entire year's worth of cover. So we looked at the projections and said, we think this is what we'll sell. We're going to buy all of that up front, which is not typically how you do it, but the supply chain kind of forced us to do that. Um, Because especially if we did better than the projections, we were going to be in real trouble Mm -hmm. if we didn't do it. And the product got uh, finally got here. We had an entire year's worth of product. And then we looked at sales rates, and sales rates on a couple of items, uh, maybe three or four, were more like half or 40% what we thought they would be. So that's what you call a good old-fashioned like inventory dumpster fire. Yes. How did we work with the retailer and internally to work through that challenge? It was a really tough place, and I think that it started with um, because we have great partners um, – there was a willingness to sit down and be honest about the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that you don't always get. And that is the difference when you have the opportunity to work with great people that are on the other side of the table, they can be realistic and they can be honest and say, Hey, yeah, this is, this is tough. And I think that. And share responsibility. I think in this case, the buyer did say, I gave you some projections that weren't weren't the best, you know, and sometimes w- maybe the definition of bad partnership is the person you're working with is like, wow, sucks to be you. You know, I mean, they're <laughs> yes. not going to say that, but it kind of is that attitude of like, man, that's unfortunate. You're in that position without taking any of the, you know, responsibility. And in this case, we had a buyer that was a true partner where they, you know, they acknowledged, hey, I'm part of the reason you're in this spot, even mm-hmm. though it's your problem to fix, I'm part of the reason. And so I want to help. In this specific instance, uh, our retail partners were having to have that conversation with 
almost every brand that they work yeah, with. Not, everybody. Be, not because they aren't tremendous at forecasting, but because there are material changes in not only su the supply chain, but the way that the world was working um, throughout this kind of transitional period um, through and then post COVID for the supply chain to get ironed out in healthy ways. And it made for a lot of difficult conversations. And in many ways, I was thankful that I only had to have the ones for our brand. It didn't have to be the retail partner on the other side of the table that had to have a lot that of was their life really, yeah, for, for a season. It, and it was just, it was a very difficult environment. And so I, I want, well, I want to pause you there. I just want to want to say something that I hear when you say that, that I think is important for everybody to hear. When we talk about being partners, part of being a good partner is that you actually put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're working with. This is that whole being relational instead of transactional thing. And even what you just said shows how you do that, right? You're not just thinking about what's the situation I'm in. And the extent that I think about the buyer that I'm working with is only in regards to my problem. You're actually taking the time to say like, what does the buyer's day feel like? You know, And what are the conversations they're having? What are the stresses they're dealing with? That's what partnership really looks like. And it has something to do with empathy and it has something to do with just self-awareness. But I think it's a foundational piece if you're going to be a really good partner. You have to try and understand what the other person is wrestling with and what they're going through, right? Absolutely. And I think that that is one of the things that sounds kind of like a no-brainer, but in many ways in business, and especially sales, um, is a little bit novel to sit down and say, I actually care about you as a person and not yeah. just what you can do for me. And the difficulties you're experiencing. So, okay, so what did we do? We had a lot of inventory. I mean, I think in this case, it was probably millions of dollars of inventory that we didn't know what we were going to do with. And what was supposed to be uh, between a six and nine month supply that looked like maybe a multi-year supply. And here's here's one thing also worth pointing out in physical retail. You're not guaranteed. Usually retailers will tell you, you have this much space for X number of months. Usually it's a, about a 12 month commitment. And so if you end up feeling like you might have two years of supply, three years of supply on an item you're making particularly for that retailer, and it's not performing very well, you might have infinity supply because yes. that item might not be on shelves nine it, months from it's now. It's the retail partner's job to sit down and say, how do I make sure that I have the best things on my shelf for my customer? Yep. And when an item doesn't perform to expectations, as a brand, we know, well, this is probably not the best it's thing go. that we can yeah. put out there for the customer. And so what we saw in this specific situation was, a willingness for the team at Walmart to sit down and say, hey, you are oversupplied uh, in part because of our projections and in part because of a really difficult supply chain that we are all sharing in. And so they were able to partner with us to help our items stay on the shelf for probably longer than, uh, than their, their performance, performance would have dictated. Yeah, yep. than their performance really would have warranted. Uh, but we also had to partner together on uh, the retail price of that item to make sure that uh, it was competitively priced in an environment where a lot of people were seeing softness in sales and needed to run promotions to be able to get out of their inventory positions. And I think what made it uniquely difficult for us is that we had made this very strategic partnership driven choice to say, we're going to make these items specific to these retail partners. Yep. So we didn't have the flexibility. That's the trade off. That's the trade off. It sounds great. Like we're going to make something unique for you. We're going to be a great partner. But oh, by the way, there is a trade off. And that trade off is when you are wrong, there's not a lot of outs. No, it, become, it becomes very difficult. And yeah. I think even in the world of uh, discount retail, uh, their phone lines were really busy. Yep. Uh, and the prices that they could buy things at, um, people were in tough positions because of the macro supply chain. And, and so it wasn't like you could go and, and sell things for uh, very much money, except for the one partnership that you had originally outlined. This is the place where we're going to sell yeah. these items. This is, it's a good point to make just um, the way that things do connect to each other. You know, when you're really small, you really don't have to think about the larger economy very much. I remember when we were at 30 million in revenue or 50 million in revenue, I'd hear people talking about the economy and stuff. And I remember thinking, I don't think about the economy. It doesn't matter to me. I don't know that it has that much of a bearing on my brand. And it probably didn't because, you know, in a multi-billion dollar market, we were $50 million of that. And so the market could swing up or down, you know, 5%, 7%.
and it might not even impact our growth trajectory or what was going on with us. But the bigger you get and the bigger partners that you work with, the more that the macro really does matter. You have to be aware of it. And in this particular case, you're making a really good point, which is these things kind of cascade on each other. And what you find is that all of your other competitors, all the other people in the space are dealing with the same thing. So not surprisingly, at the exact same moment where we had a bunch of inventory on hand that we didn't want, all of our competitors had a bunch of inventory on hand that they didn't want. Everybody had extra inventory, and that creates all these kind of pricing pressures. Everybody's putting things on sale. Mm -hmm. Everybody is going to discount retailers and saying, I got a, I got a smoking deal for you. Um, and also, nobody's placing new POs in China. And so right now, like we're in a period where the exchange rate between China and the US is at an all time, or it's, it's at the highest level it's been since 2007. And shipping rates have collapsed back down from uh, a couple of years ago to in many cases below where they were before the pandemic, couldn't have seen that coming. But all of this is a reaction to the fact that everybody got heavy on inventory. And when you're heavy on inventory, you're not buying. And so the, the way that you can experience this, the way that we've experienced this is that these things tend to kind of cascade on each other. And all of a sudden your situation can be a lot better than you think, or it can be a lot worse than you think. And it can happen in a hurry. And in this case, we were really heavy on inventory and everybody was really heavy on inventory. The changes can happen in a hurry, and yet the impact of those things will be felt much longer than I think yep. I ever would have realized. The um, when things happen to slow down the way that goods sell, it can ha it can take a very long time for brands to be able to work their way through a certain inventory position um, because people aren't spending money on those things like they used to. And I think that what was also really interesting to see coming through this period of COVID is that there was actually a little bit of a, a tail whip to where some retailers had had sustained foot traffic because they were some of the only people that could stay open. Absolutely. Um, but then the way that their supply chains got clogged up was something that I, I think very few people actually anticipated, including many of the retailers themselves. And yeah, so, they actually, they, they, they frame the term that's used is bullwhip. Um, and that's exactly what happened in, in inventory. And, you know, I, I guess to just kind of cap off that story, we worked with the retailer. We found, part, like, listen, we had to give away a bunch of those units. I, I should say have. We got to give away those as part of our, our generosity initiatives. We, we took some of that inventory and we repurposed it towards our custom sales. Uh, we got creative. We had, you know, mm -hmm. like this is this is the name of the game that you have to get creative and one of the things that I'm, I'm really, one of the hills I'll die on is business and especially entrepreneurship is about solving problems. If you don't like problem solving, you're not going to like entrepreneurship very much because it's basically a steady stream of that. And if your company's successful, congratulations, you just have more problems that you get to work on. To me, what success is, is that you have better and worse problems. And when you're successful, you get to work on fun problems and interesting problems. Hey, this is selling out really quickly. The people want more of it. How do we you know, get more coming through our supply chain? And how do we keep up with demand? Um, less fun problems uh, are the ones where it's like, I have a bunch of stuff that nobody wants to buy and I need to get out of it. Um, and you, you deal with both. So Carson, as we've scaled you know, and we're selling over 10 million units a year, do you still feel like an entrepreneur? Absolutely. I think that there are very few opportunities uh, in business that an entrepreneurial mindset can't actually be applied. And yeah, I think that I do look back on some of those early days and see the ways that things have changed, that as the company gets bigger, it's harder to have those kind of little inside jokes with every single team member that a really small, tight-knit team has. But I think that when I look out uh, over the course of not only where Simple Modern has come today, but where we believe that the Simple Modern brand will continue to grow, I still feel like these are the very early days of what this company will be. And yeah. so when I think about it from that perspective and take a step back, I say, yeah, there are so many ways that not only myself, but the other entrepreneurially minded team members can sit down and apply that type of framework and skill set um, to the individual jobs that they do. And just because people get more specialized in the way that they work doesn't mean that a level of creativity 
and excitement and first principles thinking aren't going to be incredibly effective. To use some Amazon terminology, they would say it's day one. And it was their way of trying to capture that feeling of no matter how big the company's gotten, it's still early. And these entrepreneurial principles that made the company great, we're still employing them. And I think that's what I've learned is how entrepreneurial we are actually doesn't have to do with scale. It has to do with how agile we are and our willingness to adapt and change. And you see it all around you in the business world. The moment that you start trying to say, I'm going to put this on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's just keep doing this. Let's make this easy. Let's quit adapting. Then you start to ossify. You get brittle. And the moment that you start to ossify and get brittle, it's, it's really just a countdown to death and disruption, I think, in this. And, and technology has certainly only sped that up. So you've got to stay in that entrepreneurial mindset, regardless of your size, if you want to continue to be successful. At this point, you're really running a sales organization. So you're very effective as a salesperson. But we've gotten to this scale where we're, we're working with so many different partners and we're selling so many things that a lot of your job is actually leading a team. What do you look for when you are adding a member to your team? There are a lot of things that we look for when we're adding a member to the team, but I think the most key elements that we work for, number one, is a willingness to work hard and uh, a proven track record of an ability to really get after it. I think that one of my favorite quotes comes from uh, Sam Walton's Made in America book, uh, and I think it's in the preface. Someone asked him how they had been able to make Walmart what seemed like an overnight success, and uh, his short way of saying that we've been working on this for a, a really long time was saying, friend, we just got after it and we stayed after it. Mm -hmm. And I think that the willingness to not only get after it in the beginning, but stay after it for a long time is something that um, in many ways people either already have evidence of in their life in one way or another, or they don't. And I do think that it is a hard thing to coach into people. I think that people that have an innate drive and uh, a want to uh, that they bring to the table already are the people they're going to be most successful. Can't coach want to. Can't coach inner fire. You can't. And I think that um, used to, I thought, we want to hire the smartest people possible. And I still want to hire really smart people. But I think that I have come to realize that much more important than raw intelligence is the the raw want to, the the raw care factor, the willingness to sit down and say, I'm willing to do what it takes to make sure that we give our customers an incredible experience. And so if someone doesn't bring that to the table, then they're not even going to be a good candidate for us to consider as a part of the sales team at Simple Modern. Mm-hmm. How would you evaluate that? Like what what kind of questions would you ask? What would you look for in their track record that said, hey, this is a person with high drive? Something that I ask everyone in every interview is tell me an example of a time that you've worked hard at something. And I think that sometimes people's version of working hard at something is pretty clearly like, okay, yeah. maybe that... You yeah, you learn experience. a lot about what yeah. they think working hard is, exactly, like, and how long it was, and what the you know what the what made it quote unquote hard. It's it's actually a highly qualitative question that really reveals a lot about the person. It is, I think, and I think that it's also going to be really indicative of whether um, what will be asked of them in their role um, will be something that seems overwhelming to them or something that seems life giving to them. And I think that the way that people talk about how they've responded to hard things and the way that they've overcome hard things. For many people, um, they can tend to dwell on the difficulty. And then for some people, they can tend to talk about how those hard things made them better. Mm -hmm. And when someone is able to kind of look past the individual tough things in a situation and say, here's how I actually see over the arc of my life, over the arc of this experience, that those tough patches have had the opportunity to shape who I am and have refined me and made me better. Um, people who are able to have that type of perspective are the people, um, that I want to surround myself with. Absolutely. Well, I think if there's a weakness maybe to some of the public stuff that I've done, I try to make it easy to understand. And I try to talk a lot about our culture 
it can feel very kind of like flowery, 10,000 feet. I mean, here's the reality. You and I both work hard, like by any measure, like we work hard. And I saw Patrick Collison say this once. There was a, you know, a thread on Twitter where somebody was, was kind of, you know, doing a takedown on hustle culture and how it's so stupid. And Patrick Collison replied and just said, you know, like when we were building Stripe, we just had to work really hard and it took a lot of hours and maybe somebody smarter than me could have done it without that, that amount of hard work and hours, but, but I couldn't. And, you know, when you look at the story of how anything great has been built, it is just a lot of hard work. And some of that, yeah, is, you know, how many hours you're working a day, but a lot of that is just duration. It's actually being disciplined and staying with something for a really long period of time. Um, I, I don't think that our company is defined by, hey, you're working 90 hour work weeks, although I have certainly worked some of those probably. But I think it's, in fact, the, the normative experience is probably more that people are working, you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 hours. But I do think we ask people to go hard. When you are here, you are locked in and you are, you know, eyes on the prize. And we're asking you to commit to do this for a very long period of time. And that's part of where the working hard is also. What I'm looking for when I'm evaluating if someone's going to be a good fit on the sales team is someone who uh, will really thrive in an environment where we are all pushing each other. Um, one of the things that I really like to talk about um, is that I get to see and spend a lot more time and waking hours with the people in the office today than I do with my little kids that yeah. go to bed early. and. That's a tough reality of life is that, you know, the time is limited with your children. But it's also um, puts a special importance on choosing the people that you get to spend your working hours with well. Mm -hmm. And that those should be people that are going to push you. And help and, you to level up as and a person. grow you, yes. Yeah, and you the, are the you are the average, the sum average, whatever of the seven people you spend the most time with. And it's like for many of us, especially during the phase of life we're in, that is going to be coworkers. Is a lot of that. Yes, yes. And so I'm in the fortunate position to be able to choose my coworkers, uh, and I'm thankful for that. But I view it very important that I have a responsibility to choose wisely for myself and for the rest of my team to say mm -hmm. that these are people that we're going to be proud to share a lot of this season of life with. And especially in sales, I mean, you are hiring people that are going into very important conversations where the impression that they give off about the brand uh, has millions, tens of millions of dollars worth of impact. And so it matters a lot. It matters a lot that I'm hiring somebody that's actually going to represent us and represent what we've built and what I've put a lot of hard work into. So I'm going to be especially thoughtful about who those people are. You're a pretty aggressive goal setter. And I would love to learn more about how do you set goals, but also how do you provide the support, like the balance of, you know, challenging goals and the support people need to hit goals. How do you think about that? It's a really tough thing because as someone who is naturally very achievement driven, um, I also want to make sure that we're being realistic. And so one of the ways that I think about goal setting is not just, um, comping against what should be theoretically possible in a spreadsheet, even though I do love to make those spreadsheets that <laughs> show what should right. be theoretically possible. Um, I want us to think about and be uh, an organization that continues to be agile enough to react to the circumstances that we're given. I think that one of the things that um, I've always struggled with is that when you go into a sales meeting, you never really know the other person's priorities. Anytime we go into a meeting with a retail partner, one of the biggest priorities for us is to make sure that we can walk away with a really clear understanding of what's most important to them and how we can be a part of fulfilling that partner's strategic vision. Because obviously our team's been working hard to try to figure out all the ways that we can help grow their business and what products in our portfolio can be a really good fit for them. But sometimes you walk away from a meeting really surprised to say, actually, what's important to this partner is really different than what I thought they were going to say. And I think having an organization that is willing and able to adjust and adapt our goals to say, we are willing to find the overlap between what is best for Simple Modern and what is best for you as our partner and reframe and reset where we define success. 
I think is um, a really unique thing about us. And yeah. so I, I don't live in a world where I say, hey, you told me you were going to do $100 in sales. Why didn't you do $100 in sales with anyone in our team? Like that's not the way that we operate. What we want to operate is starting from a place of what does our customer need from us to do to be able to achieve their goals? Yeah. And how are we going to work backwards to make sure that their goals and their success metrics line up with the success metrics that we give ourselves? And how do we set goals around things that we can control? Like there are things that we obviously can't, uh, we can't control, you know, global economic trends, the supply chain, you know, pandemics, the retailers and, and some of the constraints or decisions that they're facing. But there are things that we can control and the more that we can tie goals to the things that our people actually can influence, the more effective those goals are. One, a couple of examples of this, you mentioned going into a meeting and how you, you can really come across as tone deaf if you set a bunch of goals without understanding your partner. As a perfect example, the buyers that we work with, they're allocated a certain amount of space, but that's subject to change. So they could easily have, you know, whatever, 16 feet of shelf, and then they're... Um, boss comes to them and says, hey, you're actually going to get 12 this year. Y your productivity compared to appliances was not good enough. You're going to get 12 feet of space. If you had set at your goal setting or OKRs and said, well, we're going to grow that business by 25% this year, and you walk into a line review and the buyer says, well, I've got 25% less space, and you're like, well, uh, we're going to grow 25% this year. It can easily come across as tone deaf because it's like, no, you're not hearing me. I'm telling you, even me keeping you at the same sales rate is going to be difficult because I have a lot less space to work with. And so the when there might be, hey, can we still maintain the same sales rate that we have because this partner has less space to work with than they did a year before. So the more that you can understand, like you're saying, the partners that you're working with and how your goals interact with their goals, and the more that you can tie it to things that your people can control, I think that that's, uh, those are huge parts. How do you provide support to the people on your team, help them to grow as salespeople? One of the ways that we do that is I love to just sit down and work on projects or problems very specifically and very tactically with team members. Okay. It doesn't matter how granular it is, whether it is um, a back-end software that's giving someone trouble to say, hey, how do I get this item set up in this retail partner's software? Mm -hmm. um, or how do I, th this customer has this specific thing that they're wanting from our customized product portfolio. And, and here's kind of how we're trying to have to figure out, can we do that or can we do it on time? Or can, you know, um, I love sitting down and working with team members on specific problems because I think that the way that we handle specific problems um, helps build and compound the way that everyone can be prepared to handle bigger and bigger problems. Yeah, I, I think that's a really effective coaching technique that when you help people walk through their thought process and you help people with how they think through a problem, then they've got a skill that they can apply to a multitude of problems. It's it's kind of the difference between teaching somebody to, you know, giving somebody a fish and teaching somebody how to fish. And to your point, you can help somebody think through a problem no matter how small or basic that problem is. It, it doesn't necessarily re require some really complex, huge task to help somebody sharpen how they, they think about things. Yeah, and ultimately in the sales department, what we are trying to grow, myself included, and every one of us is that every day we are getting a little bit better at being the representative of the brand, of the company, to whoever it is that we have the opportunity and the privilege to get to work with across the table from us that day. One of the roles I think you fill uh, and... Uh, we, this doesn't get talked about very much, but you have a real internal leadership role, which is helping our team understand where we need to grow in terms of the products that we offer or the, the things that we're offering. Often, because of your partnership with these external part parties, you're able to come back and say, hey, we have real holes here. We can't fit this need, this need that our, our partner has. And that's been, I think, a very important part of our innovation cycle within the company is that we get a lot of input from these external partners and, and what they need us to do. Absolutely. And I think that there has, there has come from that so many great ideas for where someone, um, just because we have a good relationship is willing to say, hey, have you thought about doing it like this? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the answer is, yeah, we thought about it. And here are the seven reasons it doesn't work. Um, and sometimes it's, 
wow, that is a great idea. Let's go work on that. Let's see what we can do there. And in those situations, I think I find a really unique tension to say, how do we keep driving the organization forward, but make sure that the vision of what we're building is uniquely simple modern and not just because a really big and important client said they wanted something. It's this balance between no one knows our brand or cares about our brand more than we do, and we should be the guardians of it. But the moment that you start to think that we know best about everything, you really are in a bad place. Like good ideas can come from anywhere. Absolutely. And external feedback often is more honest than the feedback that we give ourselves and what we see when we look in the mirror. And finding a way to synthesize those two things together, it helps make you the strongest uh, company possible. Final question for you. We have a unique mission statement and you're obviously a pretty no nonsense, like let's get after it and stay after it type of person. But we do have a unique mission of we exist to give generously. How do you think you've done your job differently as a result of the mission of the company? It's not surprising that you're an entrepreneurial person or that you've built something, um, but how has building it within this company and within this mission, how has that impacted the way that you do your job? It's impacted me in a lot of ways. I think it starts with our commitment from day one to give away at least 10% of our profits. I mean, I think about so many of those first few lean years where would sit there and say, wow, kind of wish we hadn't given that money away. I'll, I'll we tell a story here it. real quick. <laughs> I remember there was a payroll that I pushed on. It was supposed to happen on a Monday and I called the bank or somebody or CFO and, and whoever. And I just said, hey, we can pay it, but we need to pay it on Friday. And I remember you calling me and being like, hey, I've talked to a lot of people. I understand what you did. That should be like the break glass in terms in, in case of emergency. People get really freaked out when a payroll doesn't hit. And so it, it's not a it's not an overstatement. There were some lean periods where every dollar kind of came in and went back out. So the idea of sending some money out towards giving felt very sacrificial at points during that. It felt very period. sacrificial. Yeah. And I think that as the company has reached, you know, more significant levels of profitability, it feels um, in some ways, like it's easy to forget like what it took to give um, and give 10% because some of that would have been reinvested in super basic things that right. other people growing a business wouldn't have blinked to say like, well, we obviously got to do this to make sure that we can keep growing. Um, and those were the things that we were willing to do in the early days. Um, but I think uh, even today, like those seeds of generosity really come through for me, really, I think, because it brings us back to a level of partnership um, it, with our clients, with our customers, the people that buy things from our sales team. I think we can keep, because of our emphasis on generosity, um, some of that is not just about how many dollars we give away in the 10%. Um, some of it is about the way that we treat uh, the clients that we have, the, the retail partners and our customers that buy things from us. And some of it is how we deliver great value to the end customer on the shelf every day. And so I think as a team, we try to keep this mindset of generosity in the, in the forefront because it is so easy and so natural uh, when you're going through a multi-month negotiation to uh, kind of devolve into a very transactional mindset to say, well, I have to make sure I get the best thing for this company. I have to yep. make sure that we do these things. And I think yep. that while we always want to make sure to that, just win, it, it's yeah. so easy to just be like, at some point you're just like, I just want to win this negotiation. Sure. And we're I, fighting over this arbitrary number. It, you know, we're, we're four cents apart. It doesn't change anybody's life. I just want to win this negotiation. There's a big temptation to be that way. And I think that the r constant reminder that we have, um, that as an organization, we exist to give generously. I think that it always helps me reframe my thinking to say, let's not get focused on the short term here. Because I think that for us to be generous in really big ways, it means that we have to have a focus on the long term. And I think that we have the privilege of doing that as a privately held organization in really unique ways to say that if this, maybe this means that we won't hit a sales goal that we did hit, that we did set at the beginning of the year. But what it means is that we have the opportunity to impact through generosity something else or mm -hmm. someone else or make someone else's thing happen this year um, 
we get to at least weigh those things. And it doesn't mean we can always do it. It doesn't mean we can make everyone's dream come true. And obviously we can't sell products for free because then we don't have the opportunity to be generous on, on our end of this. But I think what we do have a responsibility uh, and an opportunity to do is to sit down and say, how can we be as generous as possible with the way that we act, with the way that we treat people, uh, with the prices that we give um, to make sure that we are thinking through this lens of generosity in every single negotiation, even when there's this kind of natural pull against it. Absolutely. Well, great conversation. Thanks for joining us, Carson. And thank you for joining us on Scaling for Good. Scaling for Good.